We are back! And just because we've been gone doesn't mean USC Sports have. We have a full slate for you today, including previewing UC USC's big game against UCLA on Thursday. Sports Scene starts now. We had a nice game against them a couple weeks ago in Poly. We're fortunate enough to win, but that doesn't mean anything Thursday night. Uh, they're, they're probably as talented offensively as any team we've played against in the last couple of years. So we know we know how good they are, and we respect them. And it's going to be uh, uh, hopefully a, a nice atmosphere here in the Galen Center Thursday night, and we just have to compete. Welcome to the Annenberg Media Center. I'm Jackson Safong. And I'm Rachel Cohn. So, Jackson, USC is now a basketball school? Yeah, you heard that correctly, a basketball school. What happened? Well, Andy Enfield finally got the recruiting classes he wanted. He's been here for this is his third year now. He's had two full recruiting classes, including Jordan McLaughlin last year, and adding two big time freshmen this year, and Benny Boatred and Shimezu Metsu. They've brought a whole new dimension to this USC team. In years past, we've joked that they had no size and they were one of the smallest teams in the conference, and now they're one of the biggest all of a sudden. They have a great three man front rotation with Boatwright, Metsu, and Jovanovic, and then great dynamic guards as well with Jordan McLaughlin and Julian Jacobs. So USC was last in the Pac-12 last season at 3 and 15. This year they already have six conference win and they've surpassed their conference win totals from the last two season combined. How are they doing that? Well, they've been just dynamic on all, on all phases of offense. They are great at getting to the hole with Julian Jacobs. He leads the Pac-12 in assists actually. Jordan McLaughlin's in the top five as well. Benny Boatwright's dynamic. They have offensive stars and Peyton Reinhardt and Elijah Stewart as well. They, just have, they attack you in a lot of ways. They have six guys, including all five starters, who average double figures. So they're really dynamic in that sense. And obviously, they have a big game against UCLA on Thursday. What are you looking for in that matchup? Well, for me, one thing I've been noticing with the team is they struggle with free throws. They go back and forth where they can make them some games, they can't make them others. So uh, in Washington State's game last Thursday, USC only shot 62.5% on free throws, with Julian Jacobs only with 6 for 11. They obviously practiced it, and coming back this past weekend against Washington, they took their team percentage up into the 80s to 85 and a half. They need to keep that going in order to get some easy points, especially with the big guys in the middle who keep getting fouled. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, Jordan McLaughlin and Nikola Ivanovich were both above 85, 90% in the game against Washington. Both had big games. They combined for 49 points, which was half of their 98 point total. So the great thing about this USC team is they have guys that, like I said, ten, six guys averaging double figures. They don't depend on one or two guys to score every game. They have a lot of guys who can put up a lot of points. Elijah Stewart can put up a lot of points one night. Caden Reinhardt can put in a lot of points out the next night. So it's really rotating with them, and they're going to have to do that against UCLA, who, while they did get a big win against them in Paul Pavilion a few weeks ago, UCLA has some scary guys. They have Isaac Hamilton, they got Bryce Alford, they have Tony Parker in the middle, who really dominated, had a lot of offensive rebounds against USC in that game. So they're going to have to work hard on the inside and on the outside to come out with the win. So this game Thursday is definitely important for the Trojans. It's also important for rankings and standings within the Pac-12. So Jackson, where do the Trojans stand as of right now? Well, Oregon has surprised a lot of people and is at, at the top of the Pac-12 right now. There's actually four teams tied for second. USC is one of them, four teams at six and three in the conference, along with Colorado, Utah, and Washington. Arizona has been falling a little bit under expectations. They're five and four and six in the conference. So at obviously USC's big win against them in four overtimes really contributed to that. So this game on Thursday has a chance to vault them up, potentially soon to be taken over at that number one spot. Who would have thought starting this season that USC, Oregon, and Colorado would be the top spots for the Pac-12 at any point in the season. Just as a USC basketball fan for my past years being here, that's crazy to me. So for more on the Trojans' brand new rise in the rankings, let's take a closer look at offensive production. I'm here now with Paolo Ugetti to talk some USC basketball. Thanks for joining me, Paolo. Thanks for having me. So, Paolo, the Trojans are 17-5 and this season, 6-3 and in conference, which is good for second place. How have they done it this season? This season, I think, obviously their biggest improvement, you can see it in the record, 17-5, like you said, 6-3, and three, that's twice as many wins as they had in conference last year. But what's really kind of uh, vaulted there is their offense, and what's really improved their offense is the fact that they're relying and making the three-point shot a lot more. As you can see here, last year they were shooting 33% from the outside, and they were taking far less three-pointers. They were taking a lot of mid-range shots that were not going in, just really bad shots Obviously in general. Obviously, those are inefficient shots. I mean. Exactly. Inefficient shots, they're not going in. It's poor offensive performance. But as you see this year, they've really spread out their offense. And from behind the three-point line, they're shooting 39%, which is really good. It's, it's a great number to have. 
and inside they're shooting a lot better too so what they're doing outside is helping what they're doing inside if uh, you watch their games they really spread out the floor they only shoot catch and shoot uh, three-point shots all the time which is the way that you know it's, it's a more effective shot which whereas off the dribble you'd be more likely to miss it so the fact that they're shooting so well from the outside makes teams kind of have to spread out and then it opens up the middle of the court where they can go in and score in the paint well, obviously their offensive efficiency, as you can see, this is their points per 100 possessions. They're scoring 14 more points per 100 possessions, which obviously translates to great scoring. I think they're second in the conference in right. points. Last, last season, 98.7 offensive efficiency. It was good for 204th place in the country. This year, then 32nd place. So and, that's a and they lead the conference in total threes made, so they're obviously dynamic from the outside, but they do have inside scores as well, so they're really balancing their offense very well and shooting the more efficient shots. But which of the players specifically have, ha have really taken advantage of this Right. Season? These three guys have really, well, two guys have really made the jump in the three-point shooting. Um, as you see there, Jordan McLaughlin last season, he was not shooting well from behind the three-point line, and he had some injuries that really held him back as well. This season, he's shooting a remarkable, like, 42% from the three-point line, which is really helping that offense kind of flow. Because then Julian Jacobs, who's not pictured here, he can come in and handle the wall and dish out assists because he knows that Jordan's a scoring option. Elijah Stewart, a lot of people were really excited about him coming into the season because he had a good end of, uh, finish to, to last season. This season, he's, he's continued. He's shooting 43% from three-point line, which is, a, like I said, above average and above what uh, many expected from him. So that's another three-point shooter then that uh, USC has really been able to, to rely on. But most of all, I think the person who is the most outstanding player, I, I would say, or most surprising player so far is freshman Benny Boat, right? Because a lot of people expected him to be really good, but he's really taken on this offensive role that – has helped USC become an entirely different team. Without him, I think they would not be where they are. And he's, sh he's shooting 42.3% from the field, field and 35% from the three-point line. So it's, he, the offense kind of goes through him sometimes. Yeah, I mean, like you said, Benny Bowred, obviously dynamic freshman coming in right away, shooting 35.7% from three, which isn't quite as dynamic as Jordan McLaughlin or Elijah Stewart. But being able to do that from a big man position as a guy who stands 6'10", 6'11", really spaces out their offense, adds shooting, and it opens up more space in the lane for Julian Jacobs to drive and dish as he leads the conference in assists at almost six per game. That's where you get all the dunks and alley-oops. Absolutely. And so it's a big game on Thursday against UCLA at home in the Galen Center. What's your prediction? Well, uh, la a couple weeks ago, they went into Poly Pavilion and were able to get a huge win that kind of cemented their place, you know, like this is a legit team now. And now they they'll, be able to, they'll have a chance to prove it again at home, where I think Galen Center is going to be as loud and as filled up as we've seen it in the past years or so. Um, so I think USC is going to kind of drive that and uh, get this win. I'm going to say 85-80 is going to be the final score. It's definitely probably going to be highest scoring. USC obviously puts up a lot of points. UCLA has some great guards in their backcourt, Bryce Alford and Isaac Hamilton, two of the top six scores in NCAA right now. And USC really has a chance to cement their place at the top of the conference with a win on Thursday. While the field is still quiet, it's a big week for USC football because National Signing Day is tomorrow. That means we'll soon find out who the newest Trojans will be when the team takes the field next fall. This day poses a big test for new coach Clay Helton, who's going into his first season. So first, let's start up front. On the defensive line, the Trojans already have early enrollee Oluwale Betiku, and they're looking to add five-star Jonathan Kongbo and four-star Keyshawn Camp to the class. Let's start with the top JUCO prospect, Kongbo. Rachel? Right. Jonathan Kongbo withdrew his commitment from Tennessee in late November, announcing USC as one of his top prospects. Kongbo is considered the number one JUCO recruit of 2016 and could make a huge impact at SC should he choose to sign here tomorrow. And a recruit that I find interesting is Betty Hu, who's already here on campus. The four-star project prospect from Sarah High School is actually from Nigeria and he's only been playing football for two years so with only two seasons of high school football he's still a big recruit look for him to grow in his time at USC when he gets more time on the field with good coaches and Keyshawn Camp actually committed to USC in June of 2015 and then decommitted January 23rd the day before he decommitted Ohio State made the four-star commit a huge offer now as much as the Trojans would love to see camp this fall highly likely that he won't sign here and will end up at Michigan. Moving to the back of the defense, let's take a look at some potential recruits at secondary. So USC is looking to snag two talented four-star secondary recruits tomorrow to join CJ Pollard, who's already on campus. Is USC likely to get Brandon Burton? Well, Brandon Burton was originally set to make his announcement earlier January, but after coaching changes at USC, decided to wait until signing day. I do think it's highly probable that Burton ends up at USC tomorrow, though. 
And then from Long Beach Poly, four-star cornerback Jack Jones would be a great grab for the Trojans. USC is in his list of top three schools left, along with Alabama and Texas A&M. If Jones does come to USC, it would be the third year in a row that the Trojans signed the top recruit from Poly. C.J. Pollard is already enrolled for this semester and will be someone to watch for this fall. Pollard is a very physical player and can cover a lot of ground in the secondary. It'll be exciting to see how he adapts under Ronnie Bradford's coaching. Other early enrollees include Liam Jimmins and Jordan Iosefa, two three-star recruits who are looking to make a big impact this fall. So that sums it up from the defensive side of things. Obviously, we're just speculating as where these players will go because it's not going to be made official until tomorrow on signing day. While defense is obviously a focus for Clay Helton this signing day, they have a solid offensive class as well. Now let's start with some of the receivers. The USC's receiving class is really rounding into form, but which, is, which are some of the guys that stand out to you, Jody? You know, I would say Michael Pittman. He's already enrolled. He's from Oaks Christian High School, and Josh Imator Bebe from North Gwinnett. They've both already enrolled at USC. Pittman put up solid numbers on offense his senior season, and his early enrollment at USC is really going to help him continue to develop and become a dominant player. Imator Bebe, he's fast, he runs great routes, and his ability to break away from coverage will add depth to the receiver core at USC. Yeah, both of these guys, as you said, are already here. Imator Bebe took part in a, has a couple throwing sessions with Max Brown. Pittman was, not, was unable to do so as he's still recovering from his broken clavicle. But some, I think it's a bit of a stretch, but some have said Imator Bebe might be the next Juju on this team. He's a young guy coming up. We'll see. What about Tyler Vaughn? You know, Tyler Vaughn, he's committed, not yet enrolled. Um, and he's fast, he's versatile, and he has solid ball skills. So kind of putting that all together, the addition of these three guys is really going to strengthen and add depth to an already talented USC receiving core. Well, all four-star guys. Vaughn's a little bit light at 177. If he could add some weight, those ball skills will really improve, and he could be potentially a really dominant player down the road. Along with the receivers, we have quarterback Matt Fing, tight end De Devin Asai-Asai, and offensive tackle EJ Price. What did these guys bring to the table? With Matt Fink, he's a dual threat quarterback. That's something USC really hasn't seen in recent history. And that dual threat that he brings, he has it in the, his arms, he has it in the legs. And being an only early enrollee, he can train under Max Brown and Sam Darnold. So learning from the two of them, continuing to develop, is only just going to strengthen his game and make him better when his time comes at, when his time comes at USC. Well, they obviously have a lot of depth at the quarterback position now with Brown, Darnold, and Fink coming in. So what about a CSC? Or Asai Asai and EJ Price? With Asai Asai and EJ Price, both of them are currently undecided. So come National Signing Day, if they choose to commit, um, they're both going to bring depth. You have Asai Asai, who's a tight end. He's going to bring some offensive talent to a USC position that hasn't been the most developed in uh, recent history. And then you have Price, offensive tackle, big guy. Price is one of the best offensive tackles coming out of the South. If he comes to USC, he'll replenish an offensive line that wasn't necessarily a strong point of last season's team. Yeah, obviously losing Max Turk hurt the team last year, but they are going to be getting Toba Lowendon back, and they have Zach Banner and Chuma Adoga on the outside. So if EJ Price comes, as well as Nathan Smith, who's an offensive tackle who's already on campus as an early enrollee, those guys will have to be groomed into a starting position eventually as they're not going to be guys who can immediately contribute now. All of these guys are obviously going to round out a solid class for USC, another top 15 one as we come to expect with them now. That's all of our coverage on National Signing Day, though. Let's hand it over to Marshall for some special tweets from some USC coaches. Thanks, Jackson. Signing day always has its surprises, and with the top targets on USC's board still undecided, it will be another anxiety-filled day for USC coaches. With an entire new staff, USC coaches hit the recruiting road hard in January, trying to form relationships with, with kids they had never engaged with previously. While they were on, out on the road, USC coaches let the Twitter sphere know what they were up to. Once Kenechi Udeze was promoted to defensive line coach, he instantly made his presence felt on Twitter. Coach KU fired off a series of tweets with pictures in the Coliseum Tunnel of USC's past All-Americans, national championship teams, first-round draft picks, and NFL Hall of Famers on Saturday night during USC's last big weekend with official visitors. The last tweet stated, numbers never lie, and I can confirm the impressive stats do not lie at all. The path to the draft continues to go through USC as the school still has the most draft picks in NFL history. New but not so new special teams coach John Baxter, who interestingly enough has the most followers out of any coach on staff, tweeted pictures of USC's private recruiting jet last week. Head coach Clay Helton was on board as a too fluent style to see recruits around the nation with Heisman trophies in tow. Though Baxter was let go once Steve Sarkeesian was hired, he returned to Troy after a season at Michigan where he served as special teams coordinator 
to one of the top units in the country. At USC, Baxter will coach special teams as well as tight ends. As everyone knows, look good, feel good, play good. The USC equipment staff's Twitter account gave fans an inside look at the all season long as the crew tweeted pictures of the locker room, new gear, the team received, and all access videos. For Trojan fans, the account is a must follow and, and in lieu of National Signing Day, the staff tweeted pictures of team gear and the attractive LA lifestyle. That's all for social media. Let's throw it over to Cindy for a look at some other USC sports. Thanks, Marshall. With basketball season and National Signing Day commanding so much attention, the other USC sports seem to fly under the radar. It's no big deal because I've got you covered. It's time to light the torch. The women of Troy tennis team is looking forward to a little bit of redemption this week. The number four team experienced an upset after losing to the 18th ranked Pepperdine Waves, three to four. Madison Westby and Rihanna Valdez gave the Trojans a good start by claiming the first doubles match, but the Waves walked away with the overall point for doubles after winning two other matches. Despite the loss, Westby says the team is remaining optimistic. I mean, we definitely fought our, we fought really hard, but obviously this match didn't go our way. We definitely have a lot of momentum going forward, though. We're ranked four in the nation right now. Might drop a little bit, but we're definitely, we, we play Florida next week, so hopefully we can get a good win there. The women of Troy are headed to the Sunshine State to take on Florida and San Francisco this weekend. The number seven ranked USC women's swimming team received their first conference loss this weekend to number two Stanford. It was a hard fought loss as the Cardinal barely swam away with the win over the Trojans with a final score of 152 to 148. Four Trojans won individual races and set a, a pool record in the 400 yard relay. They are now five and one in conference and seven and two overall. The Trojans will finish their regular season against crosstown rival UCLA on February 12th. Men's volleyball closed out the weekend of USC sports with a loss to sixth ranked Stanford in four sets. Sophomore opposite John Rivera led USC with 13 kills and senior outside hitter Alex Slot also contributed with nine kills. Senior libero Brooks Varney equaled a career high 16 digs. Rivera and head coach Jeff Nygaard say the team is just a work in progress. You know, we're, we're having to go to the school of hard knocks and we're learning with a record. Whereas if we had a longer preseason, we had more ability to do this sort of thing, we'd probably be at a better point. But, you know, the end of the, the day, it's what you do at the end of the season, not the beginning. USC will head out on the road for two matches against number nine, UC Irvine on February 5th and UC San Diego on the 6th. From the pool to the courts, it was a rough weekend for these Trojans. But Jackson and Rachel, I think you know of a former Trojan that may be in for the weekend of his life. That's right, Cindy. There's one pro Trojan in particular who's having a pretty good week, and I think he could be in for a better weekend. I mean, we'll see. Pro Bowl center Ryan Khalil played for USC back in 2005 where he was an All-American, and now he's snapping the ball for Cam Newton in the Super Bowl. So if you can't find a rooting interest, you can always stay true to the Trojans. Go Panthers? I mean, I am rooting for the Panthers. I love Cam Newton. That guy is so cool. And I am rooting for the Panthers as well. As a Patriots fan, I cannot bring myself to root for Peyton Manning. Such bias. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned tomorrow and check back in for more updates on National Signing Day. Follow us on Twitter at SportsCeneUSC and check out the new website, uscannenbergmedia.com. We'll see you guys see you next, next week. week.